Hey, everybody! Hello. Uh, thanks for coming to our panel. Uh, this is the 4 p.m. panel, which is on social media censorship and the First Amendment. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose, but let's just kind of go down the row here and have everybody introduce themselves first. Oh, well, I get to go first. I feel special. Um, I am Channing Sherman, and you're soon going to find out that I am the least qualified person on this panel. But um, I've worked in web and social media for 20-plus years 10 of that dealing with online journalism and our social media. And we had to deal with a lot of comment moderations, not only on our social media channels, but on our forums and bulletin board services. For those of you old heads who kind of know how that works. Yes. Uh, I'm Meredith Rose, I'm Senior Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge. We're a consumer advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we do sort of tech policy writ large, uh, including a lot of the topics uh, that we've got coming up here today. Hey, everybody. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online, for, for things like privacy, free expression, innovation, fair use, do it through impact litigation, advocacy uh, in legislatures, through grassroots, and through uh, freedom-enhancing technologies offered for free and open source. I am Jim Nettles. Um, I do a number of different things, but I primarily do business and technology consulting work. Uh, I write fiction and nonfiction. I do a lot of writing in entrepreneurship, uh, technology space, privacy, data security, uh, and a lot of places in that area. I'm T.J. Myhill. I'm an attorney at Stites and Harbison here in Atlanta. And uh, unlike our other attorneys who do highbrow lobbying work, I'm the I'm the guy who works for businesses and people, and you pay me a lot of money to try and fix your problem once it has come up. So I'm the hired guy. Yeah, pretty much. That's both of them. Whereas I get to speak from a nice 30,000-foot perspective. So <laughs> all kinds. Cool. So um, there's a bunch of different angles to this. This is obviously the, the topic at hand is a thorny one, and there's about a million different ways to frame it. So because the framing of the panel is about social media and the First Amendment specifically, I kind of wanted to start off by talking, you know, what kind of speech does the First Amendment protect? Just to sort of set our terms here. Anybody can hop in with this one. Well, I think the big thing is, obviously, you want to avoid hate speech. And is what we were always taught, you can't yell fire in a movie theater, cause a panic. Oh, no. And then oh, no. Here comes Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and then scream. That, that was kind of like the baseline. But it's very weird because people always go back and forth over whether or not the government is involved when it comes to freedom of speech. Uh, if, if I may. So, uh, so what does the First Amendment protect? Well, it protects a lot of things. In fact, there's very little things that it does not protect. For example... It protects hate speech. Oh. For, that is First it Amendment is. protected speech. And then there is, uh, you know, you, you probably heard this, you know, not the first time, the shouting fire in a crowded theater. Um, and this is a line that came from a, a case, uh, uh, golly, about 100 years ago that came out of the First World War. And it was, uh, uh, the case was concerning whether you could protest against the draft. Now, you might say, you know, in your understanding of, uh, even if you're not a lawyer, that protesting against the draft is protected speech. We kind of, you know, ran through that uh, during the Vietnam War. There were a number of cases. Uh, and yes, indeed, that is, that is the current state of the law. But at the time, they said, no, uh, you could not protest uh, against the, the, the draft. Uh, the law that was pro prohibiting that was okay. And this, this case has, you know, since been overturned. Uh, and has been replaced by a, a different uh, different standard. And nevertheless, there was a line in that uh, about shouting fire in a crowded theater that was used to support what is now an, a, you know an overturned uh, ruling. So that's why I have a sort of sharp reaction when that comes about because <laughs> and like often a response to that is maybe so a little trolly, but you say you know if someone says it, well, would you say as well that you can't protest against the draft? And they'll say, oh, that has nothing to do with that. That's a completely unrelated thing. And you're like, aha! But yet they came from the same case. Uh, so the thing is that the First Amendment actually protects a lot of things. A lot of things that 
people are often, you know, uh, uh, would not want to see on their online platforms. That, uh, you know, there there's uh, many platforms trying to uphold a different standard based on their code of conduct because they're trying to have a different community. And so this is why, you know, you're going to do you know, Facebook or, or whatnot, you, you know, there is, uh, they, they don't have pornography. To have uh, nudity on, on Facebook, all that is, of course, protected by the First Amendment, with a few exceptions, like child sexual abuse materials is not protected by the First Amendment. Obscene materials uh, is not protected, but obscenity is is you know, more than just nudity. Uh, but uh, uh, very, very many things are protected, even if they would be offensive, even if they would be hurtful. And uh, you know, the the other sort of. Uh, Thing that comes up sometimes as unprotected speech is if you are uh, inciting for a, a crime, uh, and you know, it's like you know, inciting a riot, for for example. But that has to be something where there your your uh, there's an immediate reaction. Like people are going to go, you know, like go burn down that building, and like you're talking to people who have torches in their hands, and they go go burn down that building. You know, you can be prosecuted for that. But if you write a post saying that you know someday maybe we're going to need to burn down some buildings because like burn this thing down i'm so pissed off that is still protected speech because there's no immediacy in it so yeah a lot of things are protected speech and this comes to as an interesting area with social media and we'll get this you know i don't want to uh, get up to all things while we're doing the intro but uh that is uh one of the tensions is that a lot of things that are protected are nevertheless things that various platforms don't want to have on their platform yeah. one of the things just to cover the ideas of covered and not covered uh, one of the things that you know, applies in my world probably more than than, than Kurt and Meredith is defamation claims. Defamation is not protected. Mm-hmm. So false speech that is harmful to a person or a business is not going to be protected by the First Amendment. Truthful speech absolutely is. doesn't matter that the harmful nature matters whether it's true or false. So the false harmful speech is not protected. But if I truthfully say something negative about you, then that is. So... Remember that line I said about how I was the least qualified person <laughs> on the panel? This is like lawyer catnip. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I occasionally know when not to say anything. Occasionally. Teach me your ways. <laughs> okay, so this is actually so this is a good setup. So one of the things that comes out pretty, and it's it's actually good that it came out like right at the top here is the tension between sort of what the First Amendment protects in a strictly legal sense, which is a lot of stuff. Like, you actually kind of have to stretch a little bit to look for things that aren't protected by the First Amendment. That's a pretty small category of things. Versus the kinds of speech that we don't think of as useful or worthwhile or socially beneficial, and how those are two different categories. So, to zoom out a little bit, um, one of the things that I have to deal with quite a bit as someone who interfaces with Congress and talks about these things is everybody seems to have a different idea of what the problem is when we talk about social media and censorship, um, and often those beliefs tend to track the what side of the aisle you're on, um, and you get two very different views of the world. So someone want to talk about, like, what, what kind of things are we seeing on, and Channing, this is actually a really good intro for you, like, what kind of things are we seeing from your perspective that are problematic on social media? Um, like, what are some of the challenges that we're running into right now? There are almost entirely too many to list, but um, one of the big ones is how social media platforms, their almighty algorithm, social media platforms exist to show you content that will get a feeling out of you, uh, particularly anger. And what they'll normally do is show you content that feeds into your bias that you already have. And so one problem that people are saying is that, oh, I'm only seeing these con- content that says this one thing. That one thing is what's already in their spirits, what's already in their bubble. And then you also have um, bots, people who aren't even people, who are going around and spreading just a lot of bad stuff. You can guess what some of that might be. And the problem is when people go in, these social media companies, and they remove these bots, or they at least block the comments from these bots, then people who don't know that these bots are bots start complaining about censorship. So even though it's not even a human being, you've got people complaining, oh, you're blocking anybody who has this particular point of view. 
No, they're not blocking anybody. They're blocking a piece of code that was written just to make you upset about something. Well, uh, I'll probably add on a little bit of that because, yeah. again, it's one of those things we argue about free speech and social media platforms. Social media platforms are businesses. They're operating to cultivate certain environments, make money, generate revenue, and the way they do that is by advertising and mm -hmm. selling your data. And so the reaction that they look to get out of that is all about how do I drive people to keep them on the app, keep eyes going, and sell your data because I now know which way to steer you and also mm -hmm. how can I sell you more product. And a lot of the time what draws the greatest re reaction is negative. Mm -hmm. And so what we frequently see is they pull you in and drive you more and more negative with your attitude because ironically enough, then you become much more willing to keep doom scrolling and buy stuff that makes you feel better. Now, by the way, I also am an author, we run ads, so <laughs> that's the other part of my life. But uh, the reason I think that we have a big problem here is because you know, we have these applications and these platforms that are doing much more to curtail what we're allowing to be said and done and users to be shadow banned. In other words, their stuff's not being seen, it's not being posted. And we know that these organizations play with PSYOPs to drive particular opinions. And so when we look at this kind of behavior, the fact it is not regulated, and I, I'm frequently not a fan of regulating it further, but we have to remember, these platforms are not there to exist for free speech, regardless what they say. They're there to make a profit, and that profit driver also then leans towards the executive board. What are they driving towards and being aware of what their goals are as a company and as an entity? What data are they trying to gather, and what are they doing with that data? So it's interesting because a couple of different things seem to come up here, um, and I think this is one of the things we have to be cognizant about because when we talk about social media and sense, this is again going back to the original point. This is a whole giant bucket of issues, yes. some of which over, most of which overlap in some capacity, um, but they're not all the same. So like things that that I heard folks mention are things like filter bubbles. Um, which came up a lot in the aftermath of the 2016 election in Facebook. Um, filter bubbles is a huge, huge, huge part of the, the discourse. And I'm going to do the, we were talking about it before it was cool in tech policy. Um, but it really sort of exploded into the mainstream media. Um, things like shadow banning came up. Um, bot control. Um, you know, the, the fact that social media sites are private businesses. Um, and private businesses, you know, for better or for worse, private businesses also have separate First Amendment rights um, and are considered to have speech rights under the First Amendment, and they are, you know, allowed to, as part of that, have content moderation policies um, that they are allowed to craft to their will, um, which comes up, and actually, Kurt, I want to pick your brain about this, some of the state-level social media laws that have come up, um, which have, in some cases, said, like, well, if it's allowed under the First Amendment, you can't you can't ban it. Your content moderation policy must be coextensive with the First Amendment. So yeah, a couple of states uh, have, have put forth uh, social media laws. These are performative laws. They are laws that are designed to speak to a voting audience and without much regard to their constitutionality. Uh, the particular ones I'm most familiar with are the Florida and Texas laws. Uh, that you know have subsequently been been challenged. Uh, I worked mostly on the on the Florida law. Uh, this was a law that was designed to limit the ability uh, to uh, uh, take down posts. And the you know, argument was that uh, these uh, uh, social media companies were censoring conservative voices, and so that they were going to require them by law not to do that. Uh, and uh, in, in particular, this. Uh, uh, Law, you know, was imposing it on large companies that had a exception for companies that had theme parks. Theme parks in Florida. Uh, in Florida, yeah, mm -hmm. of a certain size, uh, which led to some hilarity as, as people were figuring out whether it would be cheaper for, like, you know, uh, uh, Facebook to buy a theme park or to comply with this law. Uh, probably would have been cheaper. It was a 25 acre minimum theme park. You could probably pick one of those up in Florida, not too bad. Um, in any event, this raises, you know, another aspect of this. As, as Meredith was saying, uh, the, 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 you know, 
corporate entities have their rights to to express themselves uh, as well to choose what they publish and what they don't publish and uh, this actually uh, one of the key cases on this uh, ironically enough was a florida case it was a, came up from florida was decided by the u.s supreme court uh attorney o versus uh the uh, miami herald um and this was trying a law that was trying to force the Miami Herald to put to publish an op-ed uh, from a political candidate uh, that was you know not the one that the uh, the Herald was endorsing for that uh, election, and that was unconstitutional. The Miami Herald had the right to decide what what was going to be in their opinion pages, um, and you know that was uh, the basis for that decision and subsequent decisions since then, but. One of the things that the First Amendment protects, in addition to the right to publish things, the right to not publish things, to not have mandatory uh, speech. And this is a, a, an important aspect of your freedom. I think one of the cases that actually illustrates that very well was the case against New Hampshire about whether you had to say live free or die on your license plate, which the state was mandating in a supreme act of irony. Uh, but the, the answer was that no, that they couldn't mandate that. Uh, and this is what these these state laws are are saying is we the state are going to mandate what you say on your on your website uh, and you know they're they're doing it for for their particular uh, uh, purposes but I want to hit a second issue if I, I may because I think this is also what you were getting at also they don't really want those sites to have everything the First Amendment allows because then, you know, your, your favorite social media site will be immediately filled up with porn. And there would be nothing they could do to, to stop that. And maybe that's what some people are looking for. But, like, for a lot of people, that's not what they're looking for. They want to get the porn over here. But they want to get social media from their friends uh, uh, somewhere else. And that's why, like, you know, I'm getting to, to Jim's point about the, you know, business decisions and what people want to have. They want to have a site that people come back to, and maybe they want you to have like anger and engagement, but they want to also like not have people say, "Oh my God, I'm never going there again because there's too much horrible things on here." And if you want something which you know is is closer to uh, allowing all, all the things that uh, they, the First Amendment allows, there are sites like. 4chan and 8chan and the various terrible Chan sites that, you know, uh, you don't necessarily need to check that out. If you're curious, you can just imagine. Uh, but nevertheless, it is much closer to a site that publishes all the things that uh, all the things that they for the uh, First Amendment allows in all of its terribleness. And then some. And, and there's one since we're talking about state actors, I think it's also worth remembering not only do these companies have to comply with U.S. law, they have to comply with all the different countries in which they're operating. And a lot of the time, it's easier to code for what the lowest common denominator is and what you can and can't publish. Okay, so there's a couple of different things to keep in mind kind of as we have this conversation. One is that you've got the government. You've got, and this is where the First Amendment comes in. The First Amendment, as Justin McElroy, one of my favorite podcasters, had one of my favorite tweets of all time, which is, the First Amendment protects you from the government, not from the Justin. Um, and it's a good way to remember these things. So the First Amendment specifically restricts what the government can and cannot restrict in terms of speech. Then you've got private companies that operate, uh, social media companies. Um, and, you know, there are, I think, very legitimate debates, not around whether Facebook is the government, but around <laughs> the degree to which Facebook is sort of, not doesn't have a monopoly on speech, but the concentration of public speech that goes on on some of these platforms and whether that may or may not raise special concerns when we set policy around that. Having said that, the state of the law is that right now Facebook is another company, Twitter is another company, Tumblr is another company, albeit a slightly wilder one. Um, and so you get these kinds of debates around this. Um, and one of the things, the sort of elephant in the room that we haven't talked about is Section 230. Um, does anybody want to take, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ping you again, Kurt, uh, <laughs> as the person who knows way more about 230 than I do. All right, sure. Section 230. Uh, now, it's been a lot in the news. You may have heard it by that name. It's uh, it's Section 230 of the, um, well, of the Telecommunications Act, but it, it came about as part of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. And so, the you know, Internet was pretty young, young at the time, uh, and people were concerned that there would be indecent material on the Internet that uh, you know, people could see and... Uh, 
Well, they wanted to, to make sure that that, that didn't happen. Uh, and so they passed Oops. an unconstitutional law that uh, would say, you know, limit, limiting the kinds of things on the, on the Internet uh, to try to keep it family friendly. Um, that went up to the Supreme Court and ACLU versus Reno. Uh, the court said, no, that, that's totally unconstitutional. The Internet is as protected by the First Amendment as other mediums of, of expression. Uh, you have your First Amendment of rights and Congress can't do this. One of the things that they did as part of that law was this Section 230, which survived because it was part, it was not, you know, un, un, unconstitutional. And it was trying to address the issue in a different way. One of the issues that companies were facing is under uh, some interpretations of the law at the time, there was a split in, in court decisions, but under some interpretations, if they took action to moderate, they said, okay, I'm going to take down this post, I'm not going to take down that post, then they became liable for their decisions and it gave a strong incentive for them to say hands off i'm not going to do any content moderation because if i touch it then i i'm uh, you know absorbing the liability and moderation is a very hard thing we see you know to this day with lots of technology and machine learning they still are screwing it up right so they're like moderation is super hard and if you are held liable for anything that goes goes wrong with that that could be ruinous for a company and if it weren't for 230 then only you, you would have instead of the internet that we've grown to love hate regret but nevertheless what it is today <laughs> We have things more like cable uh, cable companies, where there's a variety of channels curated by professionals, where uh, you know some might be you know more uh, wilder than others, but it would be a a uh, much more limited place, and individuals would be harder to have a voice heard in there because. Uh, I mean, you know, TJ was talking about defamation. Think about defamation. If I'm a service provider, I have no idea whether a statement is true or false. So if, you know, I say that TJ was a bank robber, uh, then, you know, it might be true. It might be false from the point of view of the provider. And it would be defamatory if, if false. But uh, uh, if it was true, I might be giving important news that people need to know about TJ and his bank robbing ways. So, uh, <laughs> right, so it, it's a very difficult thing to do. So Section 230 was designed to allow for that moderation. And so it says that, you know, sites can uh, make a decision to remove posts, uh, even if they are constitutionally protected speech, uh, and can't be held liable as a publisher for publishing the post. They will, the, the soapbox was not liable for what the speaker has said. And so that's that's where it is today. It is used as a immunity by these service providers for people who are suing them for uh, failing to moderate something. And it's not only hard, it's also expensive. Uh, the paper I worked for, we actually had moderators. We had a couple of human beings whose whole job was to sometimes respond to comments, sometimes remove the bad ones, sometimes look at them. When it came time to cut positions, that's usually some of the first ones they look at. And even now, trying to dedicate a full-time employee to just comment moderation is not an expense somebody wants, some company wants to take on. And AI is also expensive, but then you also have the problem, it doesn't read context a lot of times with AI. I've seen and heard about comments. You might mention you used a white color palette and it got blocked because the word white was in it. Not even joking. Um, I did one, I think I posted one time, um, there was a TV show and a rapper was doing, they were spoofing Dare. And the rapper had a song that said, if somebody try to give me drugs, I'm going to punch them in the face. Which, honestly, is really a great anti-drug message. But <laughs> I was just being funny and posted that in my comments. And I'm not joking. It got pulled because I was inciting violence. Mm -hmm. yep. Not joking. So, yeah, it's a combination of money and time. Yeah. I mean, and, and anybody who was on Tumblr during the Great Purge uh, remembers yeah. the phrase female presenting nipples. Yeah. Um, <laughs> permanently Wait. scarred into our collective psyche. Uh, and so, you know, we're talking mostly about text up here. Text is hard, but when you start getting into things like images, video, God forbid, anything involving software, like, just start ratcheting that difficulty up exponentially. Well, and we, so we run a virtual network called Continual, which is primarily writers and creatives talking writers and creative. 
we do right now we've done about a thousand hours worth of content in two and a half years uh, working carrying a bunch of stuff virtual well when you have a bunch of writers talking writerly stuff especially when there are a bunch of horror writers and sci-fi writers and fantasy writers and things like this there's going to be a lot of bodies on the floor there's going to be a lot of blood flying and we do a lot of work to edit the shows because we primarily go to Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. We're adding some additional platforms. But we also moderate our comments very heavily because we don't we basically don't allow as much interaction as we would like to as an org because we don't have the bandwidth to moderate to the level that we would have to to stay compliant with everything. So we have to limit a lot of the commentary um, unless you know, to basically be able to keep up and create content and allow conversations to happen. The problem there, though, and here's <laughs> it's going to be surprising to Kurt and Meredith and everybody who's been on panels when we pass, but I'm going to take a position pro regulation. <laughs> Uh, what not not necessarily regulation, but what what do we do about the situation? See, Section two hundred and thirty is a great is a great piece of legislation because it's the only one Democrats and Republicans both hate and both <laughs> want to get rid of, just for completely different reasons. Yep. Mm -hmm. So so the question really becomes: What do we do? How do we handle the question of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Discord replacing the public square? You speak about the soapbox. Where's the soapbox go? It's on Facebook now. We don't we don't speak in in, in in the park on a platform. We we post it to our to our various social medias. So how do we make sure that my voice remains heard when my voice might be the contrarian voice or not the popular voice or not the 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 mainstream voice? So that's an interesting question. So we talk about, um, in policy, we talk about carrots and sticks a lot. You know, the idea of if you want to change the behavior of someone, you either give them a carrot, so you incentivize them, you entice them to do the thing you want them to do, or you use a stick, which is where you punish them for not doing the thing you want them to do. Um, this is this is econ 101. This is my economics education at work, everyone. Um but, you know, so the idea, so you have all these, so you have things like the social media laws, which are uh, very performative attempts at sticks. Um, and then you have situations, so there's things, there's movements like change the terms, um, there's all kinds of um, sort of social consumer movements to boycott, uh, you know, advertisers, you know, so we, people have been starved out basically by advertisers dropping. Um, Alex Jones can't really, the reason, there's a reason that he, plugs extremely weird stuff on his show, and it's because absolutely no mainstream advertiser will get within 100 feet of this guy. Um, Milo, I don't even know his last name anymore, um, has flitted off into obscurity, basically, because they, he can't get advertisers for any of the stuff that he does. Um, and that's, you know, that can work sort of on an individual level, but when you're trying to pressure somebody like Facebook or Twitter, you know, or the really big spheres that sort of occasionally seem like they're beyond pressure... Um, you know, what are the what are the levers that people can try to use to influence behavior? Now, I'll speak from experience a little bit and say that Facebook is kind of an object lesson because Facebook throughout the years has been accused mostly by conservatives of censoring conservative voices. And this has been an accusation that goes over a decade back. Um, and their response to it has been to acquiesce and to essentially shift rightward in their moderation policies. Um, and it actually, you can watch the user demographics reflect that um, to the point where the general user de demographic of Facebook has gotten substantially older, substantially whiter, substantially more conservative as these other demographics have fled the platform um, because of this, this deliberate... Pr and there's all kinds of news stories that have been written about this. Um, but, you know, things like Infowars and Breitbart and all sort of right-leaning outlets get cut a lot more slack when they otherwise violate the terms of moderation policies. Um, and so that is an example of one, and I say this without judgment, one way to pressure a platform into doing what you want is to yell about it in Congress quite a bit and mm -hmm. to drag the CEO in front of them for a public tongue lashing. Um, and if your CEO happens to look like an android, then <laughs> good luck. Um, so, like, what are, you know, again, I think we all agree, everybody everybody thinks we can do it better. <laughs> I say this as a public policy person. I get paid to say that I could do it better. <laughs> um, what are some of the mechanisms that, that 
people or policymakers or investors, frankly, can use to try to influence how these, for good or for ill, how these platforms moderate their content? Or is the answer, if we'd figured that out, we'd all be very rich by now? Pretty much. Well, and actually, I think one of the things you can watch right now in the markets is that usership and, uh, and growth on all these platforms is shrinking. Um, some of them, and one of the things that we've seen is even if usership has gone up, ad revenues, the number of advertisers, a lot of that stuff is starting to go down because people are looking at it and tired of a lot of the things that get seen posted. They're tired of doom scrolling and people are now looking for platforms that or, or other alternatives that more reinforce it. And so seeing some of these companies take a hit in the pocketbook is the first place that, that makes a change. If you don't use the toys and the advertisers have you know aren't dropping in the revenue and the money and everything else, there's a change. There's a reason that when you know Facebook did their quarterly uh, quarterly meeting in the spring, there were a lot of employees crying and all of a sudden going and saying, wait a minute, we're no longer going to have X, Y, and Z in the break room because and, and we have to work um, and we're going to start laying people off. Everybody has sort of seen a, a big part of the game as, as platforms, more of them are coming up and more of them are more specialized to their audiences. And I think that's going to be part of it is going to be trying to blend what companies are trying to serve very specific demographics instead of having larger platforms trying to serve all demographics and create those neighborhoods. I'll be honest with you, though, that's my greatest fear. Mm -hmm. Because you get you get all these niche platforms where you can go and hear exactly what you want to hear and everyone thinks just like you. All that does is reinforce your your own worst It's points. the bubble again. Yeah, it's the bubble. you get... You get you just spiral further and further down into your own extremism. The, the flip side of that, though, is so I'm I'm a Tumblr advocate in a lot of ways. Um, God help me. Uh, but uh, no, so Tumblr and I, I bring them up because they're a really interesting. Why case do you study. hate female presenting nipples? I <laughs> I I own two of them actually, so I don't hate them that much. Um, but uh, no, so so okay, so Tumblr has had a, a kind of weird and wild history. It, the super short version, they existed. They were really weird. Verizon was like, ah, oh, we'll buy that one. And that just, um, and they bought it and then they lost a ton of money on it. Um, part of what Tumblr does is it's very, very in tune with its user base. And its user base is largely young. It's largely queer. It is largely, um, it is largely non-cis male. I think it's just everything other than that label. There's a lot of them on Tumblr. Um, and so the Tumblr engineers are very privacy cognizant. Um, and to the point where it actually scuttled their relationship with Yahoo when they got bought. Um, there's just tons of stories that are now coming out about this, but they do not collect any real meaningful demographic data about their users. And as a result, they cannot serve targeted advertising even if they wanted to, which is why you get really weird ads on Tumblr for like <laughs> Manscaped. <laughs> um, this was a meme for a while. It's like everyone's going to buy the, the man hair trimmers. Um, <laughs> They're great I'm trying to figure gifts. out if I could say balls at a 4 p.m. panel. Um, <laughs> but it's it's stuff like that. And so you know, now they do things like Tumblr Blaze. So they can't sell ads to actual advertisers, but they can sell ads to their users where you can pay 10 bucks and serve like a thousand random Tumblr users any post of your choice. So people like Blaze pictures of their cats. Um, it's, it's just wild, but it's, that's a situation where you've got, you know, and, and concerns about bubble chamber, uh, echo chambers being very real. I, again, I was on Tumblr before the purge. It was, it was quite a place. Um, having said that, there's a fine line that I think you need to acknowledge, and we can disagree about where it is, between echo chambers and places where communities that are otherwise extremely marginalized and tend to be pushed out of major platforms mm -hmm. congregate in order to speak with each other. Um, and I don't think that there's anything necessarily like to a moral valence about that, even those communities sometimes are communities that I maybe find abhorrent, um, like politically or morally. It, these spaces do exist, and I think we can kind of disagree about whether it would be better for our social discourse if we had more of those spaces or if we had fewer of them. Well, and, and so there's two things I want to say. Number one, just because I'm saying this the way we see things going does not mean I believe that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Because I think that niche platforms serve an extraordinarily 
important purpose because I think like looking at Tumblr and pre-purge, the fact that they serve a very specialized community gives a degree of protection there to those people and those users from certain kinds of, of con- or, or certain mm-hmm. types of contents and things that, that we see and happen be problematic. However, I also am very much a firm believer that we should create platforms where there is the ability to have civil discourse and you can look at somebody and call them a jackass and then move on. But it, we as people also then have to take on some degree of personal responsibility about how we're using the platforms. So oh, wait, did I just break the toys? <laughs> uh, so I think one of the, the chats, niche, niche communities are, are a very important thing. One of the examples we've used in some of our briefings is called Vegan Forum, and they allow all sorts of things, but you can't be against veganism. And like that seems to be a sensible content moderation rule for trying to maintain the forum that they're, they're making. And if you remove that, it, maybe it's not vegan forum anymore. And so like there are many... Each community will have its own uh, standards, and they can balance out. So, if, like, if you have, if you're thinking about all sorts of small communities, this seems to be like a good thing. And some of them may be communities that are making an echo chamber with with which you you uh, you know don't agree or will reinforce that. But it's a, it's a the the alternative is kind of a weird thing because what a lot of people seem to want is they want a place where they can speak out to other people, and so other people will necessarily hear them. But if those other people actually prefer the echo chamber and don't want to hear them, mm-hmm. uh, you can't really make other people listen to you. That's not one of your First Amendment rights. It's to speak, but not to make others listen. And, you know, you can go out there and create your own website. The, you know, I could have Kurt Forum, and Kurt Forum could have Kurt Friendly Rules. And maybe nobody comes to it, but that's, you know, that, there it is. So that people want to like I'll give uh, just an example like Truth Social was the you know the Trump's uh, competitor to uh, Twitter and you know, a lot less people are going there and it is it does have more of an echo chamber you, you, the, your conservative voices will not be you know uh, uh, censored there but people still prefer to put those voices out on Twitter so that they can have that heard by people who are not in the echo chamber because that's who they want to reach and so it is, it's, it's, it's more than just like the, the, uh, people want to have, uh, an echo chamber or enjoy listening, but they also want to have their voices heard by the other ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is a, that is a challenging thing to, to arrange. Right. Because that goes right back to the question I had, which is how do we make sure that I have a platform that my, I mean, you can have a platform, but well, we can't, can't make, make, I'm not going to make sure that anyone listens to you. But, but the <laughs> question, but, but the question is for the, for the mass media, the, the public square social mm-hmm. media. How do I make sure that everyone has a turn at the soapbox? Well, I mean, here's the thing. So I, I've been to Hyde Park, where the you know the original like speakers' corner was, and there's some soapboxes there. Uh, and some people would come by, stop for a few minutes. A few people would stay stay longer. Uh, I got up on the soapbox talking about digital rights. That did not interest the crowd super much, but a few people listened. But that's the thing. Like, I was not able to reach everybody in the park or everybody in the city of London from that soapbook. It was all those who wanted to come by for it. So you right. can replicate that right now. But if, but if, but if Facebook or Twitter or Instagram had a blockade to the soapbox and didn't let Kirk talk about digital rights because no one's interested, yeah, and that's where we are. And, 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 and I'm not saying it's, I'm yeah. against all the regulate, but I, I, I do, <laughs> I do question. How do we address the, yeah. the fact that we get everybody's voices? I, I will yeah. just pop in real quick and say that there has actually been at least one case that has dealt with this a little bit um, in the context of Facebook and, and municipal governments having space on Facebook. So this is actually interesting because this is really, really the case where the rubber most meets the road, I think. Um, a lot of local governments have official presences on Facebook, and that is in many cases how they get news or announcements out to their user base. Now, I think they're actually starting to move away from that a little bit because of the shift in Facebook demographics. But there are they they do have spaces for, like, this is where we're having our community meeting. This is when the PTA meeting is happening. Da-da-da-da-da. Um, and there is at least one case where somebody got blocked from commenting on their municipal Facebook page, like their city's Facebook page, and the court was like, actually, that's, you actually can't do that. Like, it's, it's a Facebook page, fine, but it is the official forum for this particular organ of government. Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore, like, that was sort of the most extreme case where even a court was like, eh, I'm not really comfortable with this. Um, just to go back on the subject of niche communities, as somebody who's a member of several and who helped co-found one, they serve 
they serve a purpose. I do get the idea of the echo chamber, but I know, particularly for minorities and members of the LGBTQ community, it's a safe space. And I know that gets to be a bad word, but if you're a cosplayer of color and you go and say, hey, how can my Superman cosplay look a little bit better? And the first comment is, bleach your skin. That's that that's that's a little rough. Um, also, by the same token, if you're maybe a cosplayer who's a little bit heavier, and you say, "Hey, how can I make my Superman cosplayer look better?" and they say, "Eat a salad." Um, so it's it's mm-hmm. comments like that. Sometimes you don't want to have your your opinions echoed back to you. Sometimes you just want a place where you can actually get some useful information um, from peers. And a lot of times, some of these niche communities aren't super exclusive. Um, I've run a group here, the Black Geeks of Dragon Con. We've got white people in our group. They come in, they comment, and as long as they act right, uh, to, put it, to put it simply, yeah, yeah, as long as they act right, they are perfectly um, fine to stay. They don't have to come in and be super pro-black. I don't need to see them wearing a Malcolm X cap whenever, but just, just, just come, be an ally, offer constructive criticism. Um, and just to follow up on another thing, um, as far as how to solve this, back when people were actually fighting and caring about net neutrality, there was a push to have the internet declared as a utility, kind of like electricity and water. And is I'll post this to the group, is that something that might be at least a step in the right direction? So I will, uh, somebody who spent many, many months of her life working on net neutrality, um, it's it's complicated. So in that, uh, and that's the most lawyer answer I can possibly give. Um, net neutrality was interesting because that specifically had to do with broadband access um, and mostly to do with residential broadband access. Um, and the idea behind net neutrality is that, among other things, um, you know, your residential broadband provider cannot discriminate or fast, it can't discriminate against certain kinds of traffic. So it can't, as a flip side of that, it also can't fast track certain kinds of traffic. So like, you know, Comcast, especially now Comcast is one of those like super vertically integrated conglomerates where they own NBC. And so the question is like, well, are they going to fast track NBC's streaming service and then downgrade Netflix or Disney or whatever else? Um, you know, I think that's a complicated proposition. I, I don't know that that translates super well to social media because, you know, as much as we complain that, you know, Facebook and Twitter are really dominate the field, they're also not my only option um, at the end of the day. And I know it doesn't always feel like I've got a lot of options, but like technically I do. Um, you know, and I, I have avail- I have, I've deleted Facebook. I'm off. Um, you know, I should delete Twitter. I haven't yet. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the landscape is a little bit different as opposed to when I moved into my house, I have one ISP I get to use <laughs> or I can take my chances on dial up. So um, I did want to leave a little bit of time for questions for, for folks. I saw a couple of hands up. Um, I don't know. Do we have the, the box mic or are we just doing a uh, stand up mic? Stand up. Stand up mic. All right. While we're waiting for the line, I did just want to throw out there. I, I don't have anything against niche communities. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of some really niche communities. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but th- that should always exist on the internet. What I'm afraid of is what's happening to Facebook, right? It's becoming old, white, and conservative. Mm-hmm. And that's never going to then let that community get exposed to a contrarian viewpoint or a different thought. And you're just going to end up with people getting the most extremely biased, radicalization, radical, yeah. chamber conservative yeah. views, and it and that feeds down that pipeline, and we end up being more and more team sports rather than intelligent decisions when it comes to politics. Yeah. By the way, uh, I'm a big fan of these kind of niche community networks that you're talking about, and I'm just wondering what the ramifications would be if Section 230 was overturned. Would those networks survive, or would they be severely handicapped? I'll go with severely handicapped. Section 230 is uh, a very powerful force for uh, uh, protecting a... Uh, the ability of a, a forum to survive, it's its vital for the big forums, but it's also vital for the small ones. And actually, the big forums are better equipped to handle regulation, uh, content moderation, than a small forum is. So uh, for some of these things which are you know, trying to go after the, the, the larger places will... Uh, uh, be a stranglehold on some of the uh, of the smaller ones because you know they can't, you can't you know a small forum have 
a team of 24 hour a day human moderators and then or you're like okay well everything goes into a queue until the human moderator gets around to it and so like you post something and it shows up three weeks later and it was about the news that day right that's that's a that's going to be a tough thing. And the other thing that 230 does is if you get sued, then you can say, look, hey, check out Section 230, uh, you know, get out of here with your with your case. And that is disincentivizes people from suing in the first place. And it means if it does suit, the suit will not be that costly. If you don't have 230, even if you're going to win, it will be very costly to, to do so. And so that's uh, another challenge for a small niche community. Yeah, this does be why I'm against those regulation and Really against regulation here too, because that I work with a lot of small businesses, uh, and that's it's it's a very different world when you're if you're if you're Coke, if you're Facebook, if you're Instagram, you can go ahead and, and pay legal fees. When I send bills to most of my clients, we have you know long discussions about why they need to pay them. So <laughs> it's it's a it's a challenging it's a challenging area. It does put a lot more of the burden on the the little guy. Um, make, let me make sure I can articulate this properly. Uh, the Supreme Court is not likely to change in the next 10 years, maybe 15 years. Uh, and so I have a little bit of a concern about the right to privacy and how it may, it's going to be limited and maybe going away, you know, at least based upon Griswold. Um, so, um, my question is, is how will that affect uh, social media and uh, uh, and where do you think we're headed? All right. Uh, so there, absolutely, this is a this is a very valid uh, concern. And for those who, who uh, are unfamiliar with Griswold, this is we're talking about the right to privacy that was uh, uh, part of our constitutional law. Uh, and was one of the underpinnings of Roe v. Wade, so till recently, and then the, the Supreme Court overturned that uh, in, in Dobbs. I mean, it was overturning the right to an abortion, but part of the legal theory behind that was based on a right to privacy, that like you know, the private decisions you would be making about whether or not to uh, carry a child. And this same body of law was also being used for a number of other private decisions, uh, decisions that were about you know, what uh, you would know, have contraceptives, what uh, uh, you did in your, your bedroom, uh, that are underpinnings of, of a lot of other areas uh, of law. And now uh, the, the um, I guess it was in a concurring opinion, uh, or Kavanaugh said, don't worry about it, we're just, this is totally just about this one thing. And then in a, another concurring opinion, Thomas said, yeah, it's about these other things, we're going for it. Uh, so this has, has uh, you know, a, a concerning, certainly. I'm, I think a, a very, very concerning. Um, I don't know if that is going to directly affect on the, the First Amendment, but indirectly, because what we've seen in the post-Dobbs is there's a number of statutes which are not only trying to either have trigger laws or immediate laws that make it unlawful to have an abortion, but also to advertise these services or advertise the availability of medicant abortions from out of state. Uh, and these are speech bills or words, you know, can't give instructions or information about it. And these are directly on the speech issues uh, and trying to target what speech can happen online. So as a secondary effect, both, you know, and, and for abortion and post dobs but for other things, if they, those fall, that things that, that they previously couldn't make illegal, in addition to making them illegal, there may be attempts to also squelch any conversation about it. I think those things would be unconstitutional under the First Amendment, but also uh, I think that the, you know, the right to privacy is a constitutional uh, right. And if I could actually add a little bit, one of the big differences we have now that we did not have, <clears throat> I'm going to say 15 years ago, is now we have this device yep. all of, on us all the time. When you go home, you've got Alexa and all this stuff plugged in. I don't, but you've got all these devices, and I've seen a number of things coming through you might be able to comment on, where, in essence, there are pushes for governments to be able to use these devices because you're using a private application that collects a lot of what goes on around you, collect pictures, sounds, what's happening. So privacy is, we are enabling the technology that is eroding privacy on a rocket sled. And the question is, 
are the laws going to come in to protect us from ourselves? Um, I believe it was Meredith that brought something up that touched on something maybe a little bit more local. Uh, you were uh, you mentioned how uh, local governments, or some of them at least, were using Facebook as their primary uh, mm -hmm. uh, way of relating to the public. Um, that makes things difficult on those of us who prefer to stick to open platforms. <laughs> DragonCon is guilty of this too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, so this is less about, about politics and more about Dragon Con. Uh, it's not terribly fun when uh, things like hotel rooms are only announced on Twitter. The only reason I have my hotel room is because someone who deigned to use Twitter told me that they were available. Um, so who would one talk to at Dragon Con to remind them that RSS and email are things that exist and that maybe they might be worth using? Start with the man in the corner. <laughs> Sorry, Scott. <laughs> this is some great A underbussing of my part. Well, I throw other people under the bus, but. Uh... Oh, I'm uh -oh. Sure you're pointing at me. I more, more <laughs> <than> <laughs> <somewhere else. laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, Dave Cody is um, co chairman of Dragon Con, and anything about, the, uh, anything about the online experience, really, you should take it back to him. You can send it to me, and I'll be happy to forward it, but mm -hmm. it's. It's not my decision ultimately, but I think Dave Cody really has the the ultimate responsibility for that. He's the, the name that you should look up, and, and I think okay. you can find him. And I can help you, or I can forward the message on to you, on to him, if you'd like me to do that. But okay, um, um, sorry. Fair comment. Yeah. Fair comment. And I, I guess just to keep the question at least somewhat on topic, uh, do do any of you have commentary on uh, um, the effects of? Uh, public institutions such as government uh, relying on specific closed platforms for their communication. It makes me very anxious. Yeah. I get the impulse, but at the same time, yeah. Um, so this also comes into, um, I think probably where this becomes most dramatic is when you have things like disaster preparedness, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of governments have chosen to move. I think I think generally it's not a bad idea that they will send out um, you know alerts through various social media platforms when there is some kind of disaster coming um, as a way to quickly notify the public. Having said that, what happens when you that is your only method of communicating necessarily? Um, that becomes a problem. So. I think it's also an issue when for a lot of these platforms, it's the government, trying to be young. It's literally that hello fellow kids meme. I mean, if you've ever okay. seen, I mean, you don't, do you really want to see your mayor on TikTok giving the state of the city address? So if they used it better and they didn't use it as their primary, yeah, I'd be okay with it. But, and also, again, it goes back to resources. So now you got somebody trying to manage your website, your Facebook page or Twitter page, it, yeah, it's just murky, muddy in the this waters. Is, this is how we keep Gen Z employed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, fellow kids. <laughs> I think we can do one more. Scott, I don't know what we're running up on time. Um, five minutes? About five minutes? Okay, I think we can do, yeah, one more. So, has the some of the revenge laws had any impact on 230? And for private entities, does the First Amendment really apply if it's not dictated by the government? So I can't speak to the revenge porn laws because I'm not as familiar with them, but I will say that generally, the it, generally no, um, like private entities is a very very broad rule are not bound to observe the First Amendment because it protects you from the government, not the Justin. Um, and so you know, and the countervailing First Amendment right there is like Twitter has a First Amendment right to have its own content moderation policy and decide what it does and doesn't want on its platform. Um, I can't speak to the revenge porn. I can. So as far as the, I've done plenty of panels of revenge porn for you. So uh, as far as the revenge porn laws, as they're all shaping out, they basically go to um, content and intent. Um, these are criminal laws, so there has to be some intent. But uh, they're mostly concerned with what content you are posting, which would generally impact free speech. But again, we're talking about uh, we're talking about defamation. We're talking about invasion of privacy. We're talking about um, uh, obscenity in some cases. So there's, it, we're not really bumping up against First Amendment concerns when someone wants to um, post revenge porn to harm their former partner. 
um, or, 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 you know, whoever else they got content from. So most of these laws are, are tailored to, to not have anything to do with whether the internet is considered a common carrier or a utility or, or, or not. It's just a question of what did that individual put online and what was their intent for doing so. Is it not a requirement for removal, though? I thought that was part of, I think, the California law, maybe, but... Well, um, yeah, it, it, every state yeah, has its own law. Oh, so the question the question was, is there not a, a requirement for removal? And there is. It, it, every state has their, well, not every state has one, but every state that has one has their own various uh, permutation of revenge porn law. But certainly taking that content down is what the victim of that wants. But again, we're, we're dealing with, in that instance, a victim of a crime, not, not someone who just had a bad review of their Fried rice at their restaurant, all right? I mean, that, if 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 I give if I give a negative a negative review or I give a negative uh, opinion of someone, that's not the same as as causing someone direct harm. Great. Well, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, please, I am being reminded by a sticker uh, to go into your uh, DragonCon app and rate this panel. Uh, please give us five stars, and that way they will feed us. Um, but thanks everyone for coming out um, and for all the thoughtful questions, and enjoy your con.